services business are, you know, the word that I guess we use in services land, force multipliers that expand opportunities and increase productivity across other sectors of the economy. But that only works if we keep our economies open. As misplaced as a mercantilist orientation is with regard to goods, it is even more so with respect to services. Services imports bring with them embedded technology, know-how, and innovation. Researchers are also finding the downstream effects of services FDI is more profound than foreign direct investment in other sectors. The United States is the world's largest importer of services, and no doubt that's one of the elements that keeps us competitive. U.S. productivity per worker in the non-farm business sector doubled in the decade after 1995, and the size of the U.S. economy has grown by 66% since 1990, thanks largely to services-driven innovation. This drive for innovation creates jobs. Over the past two decades, the U.S. services sector has created nearly 30 million new jobs across the full range of services, whether it's software engineers, nurses, lawyers, instructors, mutual fund managers, and the like. And the dichotomy between a good manufacturing economy and a good services economy is a false dichotomy. It is not a zero-sum game. In fact, today's modern manufacturing industries increasingly work hand-in-hand hand with vibrant services companies. Manufactured goods today come packaged with sophisticated services features. For instance, aircraft engines feed real-time data to engineers to monitor performance and safety. Modern manufacturers need design consultants, comp computing services, advertisers, accountants, banks, insurance, and a whole host of other services inputs. And access to a global communication and transportation network enables greater specialization in the production, in production generally by spreading the manufacturing process across multiple locations. Manufacturers are free to concentrate on what they do best when an effective services infrastructure is in place and they're better able to get goods to customers at the end of the day. So what does this have to do with India and China? Well, some of these benefits of services, innovation, and growth are coming today to our relationship with China and India. Cross-border services trade with China and India has grown sharply over the past decade, exceeding $25 billion with China and $22 billion um, with India. India is, opening its I India is opening of its IT sector to FDI in the late 1990s, triggered 20% annual growth in business services and 50% for software exports. The IT sector now accounts for more than half of India's services exports and attracts five billion of FDI per year. India's overall services sector accounts for more than half of India's GDP. China likewise certainly recognizes the importance of the growth of its services sector to help transform itself from an export-driven economy um, to an economy that that is more geared towards promoting the development of a modern services sector. China's intention to further relax access to its services market and to expand possibilities for private investment will help to increase its share of services in its GDP. And further development of China's services sector can also help address the current challenges that China faces regarding job creation. You know, we all have seen that China facing, faces ri rising levels of unemployment, and the International Labor Organization estimates that China needs to create more than 10 million new jobs each year. It'll be interesting to see how China's intentions in this regard play out in practice. We're hopeful that China will welcome greater participation of foreign companies to help spur the modernization of its services sector, including in infrastructure enhancing and R&D rich sectors such as telecom, financial services, logistics, express delivery, travel technologies, third-party auto liability insurance, and other key sectors. This is all very exciting, and it's important to recognize our success in the U United States' services ties with both India and China. But I think we should, be al we should also be asking ourselves, how are services not contributing to innovation and growth in China and India? In other words, where are we coming up short? One area, one important area is affiliate services sales, or quote unquote, mode three services through direct investment. 
globally, U.S. affiliate sales services offered through direct investment is nearly twice as large as our cross-border exports. And that data doesn't even include banks. The same is true in the other direction. Affiliate sales in the United States by foreign companies invested here are nearly double the amount of services supplied cross-border. Investment just happens to be an important and efficient and an effective way of supplying services internationally. Those investments come with a great deal of R&D. For instance, rough, roughly half of Euro European R&D is provided through U.S. affiliates. But look at China and India. Affiliate services sales in India and China, rather than being twice as large as cross-border exports, are much less than cross-border exports. Service affiliate sales in Ireland are currently three times that of India and China combined. That's great for Ireland, but also a challenge to our trade relationship with China and India. Is there any reason why the United States should not want services investment and activity in the world's two most popular countries to exceed the services activity in a country the size of Ireland? Don't China's and India's private company affiliates want services and investment activity in the world's largest economy and in the world's most competitive service sector? I like asking questions. Don't workers in all three countries want to benefit from the research, know-how, and skills that come with these investments? And don't these workers not want to increase their productivity, global competitiveness, and ultimately their standard of living? Clearly, we can do more in the services area, and we are very far from reaching our potential with China and India. Where do we start? First, it's always probably a good idea to set ambitious goals. It focuses the mind. For example, U.S. services trade with India and China roughly doubled in the three years between 2004 and 2007. Let's do that again. We should work to double our services trade with India and China again between 2009 and 2012. There are many ways to achieve this goal or even surpass it. In China, we are hopeful that China will welcome greater participation of foreign companies to help spur on the modernization of its services sector including in the infrastructure enhancing and R&D rich sectors such as telecom, information technology, financial services, logistics and express delivery services, travel technologies, audiovisual services, and other key sectors. This will be an important goal of the upcoming JCCT talks in Hangzhou, as well as in future dialogues that we have with our Chinese counterparts. For its part, we are hoping India will allow more foreign participation in a range of sectors, including financial services, express delivery, telecom, and retail. Opening these sectors will offer India's global giants access to services provided by globally recognized providers. And allowing more FDI in the retail sector will help target foreign investment to India's critical infrastructure needs develop nation industries, improve access to markets for India's farmers and factory workers, and above all, create jobs throughout all parts of India. And it will help facilitate the, the transfer of technology that India badly needs. These issues will be a key part of the upcoming trade policy forum discussions that Ambassador Kirk and Minister Sharma will have in New Delhi later this month. And in addition to our bilateral talks with India and China, a robust outcome on services is critical to the success of the Doha round, which I know um, folks have already talked about today. Let me close with one final thought. Any issue with the United States, China, and India is by definition a global issue and a global challenge. When we're talking about the United States, China, and India, it's not so much a discussion of the benefits to a specific sector of opening up to trade and investment, but it's really the benefits to the entire economy of building a 21st century services infrastructure, which by its nature will be connected by global networks. Our appetite for world-class services and our shared recognition of the benefits of services sector growth for infrastructure development and for job creation, regardless of which country they originate from, makes us a good partner for working together on services trade. Greater liberalization of services will benefit us all, and we have every reason to work more collaboratively to promote trade.